going to talk about the, the flow wave ocean energy research facility that we have at, at the University of Edinburgh and uh, at some of the work that we that we do in flow wave. Um, we've been we've been doing model testing at the university for a very, very long time. And uh, uh, I suppose our, our work in tank testing started in the 1970s with Stephen Salter's work on wave power. And, uh, and the Wave Power Group developed a lot of tank testing technologies uh, because the standard tank tests, which were not, uh, which were done by hydrodynamic laboratories, weren't appropriate for testing wave energy devices. And so here we can see the wide tank uh, and, and its successor, the curved tank, which uh, Pedro was showing some tests in earlier on. Um, we still use the curved tank, and it's and it's still there. It's a very small scale facility. It's about one to one hundredth scale uh, for, for wave conditions. Um, having shown that a curved arc of wave makers could work, we wanted to build a circular tank. And so the flow wave facility is a fully circular tank. Uh, we've been in operation since 2014 and it combines waves and tidal current. Um, and uh, if we were doing this as a physical meeting, we would invite you all along to come and have a have a look around the facility and and so that you could see it. And in the picture in the background here, we're we're doing one of our our party tricks. Um, so we we are looking primarily at the performance and survival assessment of wave and tidal energy devices and floating winds. We're looking at technology R and D, and we're also involved in guidance and standards. So the, the lab itself conducts a range of activities in, in different areas and tests in a number of different applications. Today, I'm mostly gonna talk about marine renewables, um, but obviously some of the output of the tank tests influences model validation, which is an area that I normally work in. Um, and uh, we also uh, developing new me measurement technologies and we work on international standards. And we've also been doing a lot of work on robotics and autonomous systems for inspection of offshore energy devices. So just to give you a flavor of some of the testing, this is a, this is a wave energy device, a couple of wave energy devices being tested uh, in some work that we were doing for Wave Energy Scotland as part of their new wave energy devices call uh, two. Um, and uh, the, uh, the Device, um, uh, the device that's on the floor of the tank there uh, is, uh, is, currently, um, is currently being prepared to go to sea. Um, and I expect probably Marcus was talking about that earlier on because it, they're, they're using the CGEN technology. When you're, when you're doing model testing, we use a lot of measurement and you can see on these models, these little gray balls on sticks uh, and they're part of a quality system that gives us measurements of the motion of devices to less than a millimeter um, accuracy, uh, or I should say more than a millimeter of accuracy. Um, and uh, we also have an underwater system for doing that. So we can, we can measure the motion of systems above the water and underwater. And uh, I thought I'd show you some testing. Uh, so uh, Pedro talked about this before, but this is the, uh, this is some of the tests that we did for the W2 power platform uh, for Pedro. And what you can't see in this, in, in this video is that we are modeling, uh, we're measuring the, the motion of the platform and the motion of the rotors and the motion of the mooring system using that quality system. And so this is the kind of video that you get out of that system. So we're able to get very accurate measurements of the motion of all the components. And once you've done this kind of testing, then obviously it leads to, to full scale sea trials and, and or, or small scale sea trials. And really, I think the process that people go through is to is to build out from, uh, as we've seen from, from, from conceptual tests, small scale lab tests, bigger scale lab tests, and then eventually to sea. And in going through that process, you're de-risking the, the, the installation process. At the larger scales of tank tests, there are things that you can test which you cannot test at smaller scale because the forces and the accelerations and things don't scale linearly. So why did we build a circular tank? Well, what we're really interested in is we're interested in reprodu reproducing site conditions. And we want to accurately reproduce the site conditions as realistically as we possibly can. 
And that enables us to learn about specific sites, specific performance issues, and to build confidence in, in the technology readiness level of our technologies. Um, when you test in a square tank, you are constraining the direction that the waves can come from. And when you look at the real sea, the waves come from many more directions than you can, than you can test for in a, in a square tank, which is one of the reasons for building a circular wave tank. So if we're going to recreate wave conditions in the tank, then we need a good data set. We need good spatial and temporal coverage of the site. We want to measure everything that we possibly can. And we want to try and understand those details. And if we're doing that for waves, then we need time series, directional spectra. We want significant wave heights and periods and so on. And if we're doing it for a tidal site, then we want time series and multiple spatial measurements. We want to know about wave conditions and so on. When we've got those, we can do a number of different things. And the standard approach that people use to replicating a site is that you take all the points on your wave scatter diagram and you bin them. And then you say, well, OK, I'm going to my, my site's conditions typically have a two meter high wave height and a, and a 10 second period. So I'm going to go and do some tests in a tank with two meter high waves, 10 second period and a John Swap spectrum. But one of the things that you're doing when you do that is you're ignoring the fact that actually the spectral shapes are completely different within those bins. And what you can see on the right hand side of this image is a whole load of instantaneous, or not instantaneous, but, but 15 minute wave spectrums from, from, the, uh, from the EMEX site, and they're plotted in gray. And then there's a sort of average spectrum plotted as the black line. And these spectra are, are, are all very, very different, although they all fall in the same bin in the, in the, in the binning approach. So what we're going to do to try and recreate a C state is we're going to take the wave boy data, we're going to reduce it, we're going to come up with a set of representative C states, we're going to test those states in the tank and recreate them, we're going to verify that we're seeing what we get. And we went through this process, uh, and, and I could have spent about an hour or so today discussing it in detail, but we don't have that much time. But what we ended up with was a set of 41 model C states that represent the conditions at EMEC. Um, we've used a binning approach and we've clustered things together. And what you can see on the scatter diagram is you can see green and red marks that represent the, 40, uh, the 41 C states. The green spots are ones that we can use. We can recreate those in the tank. And you'll see that in some of the frequency bins, there are two spots that are very, very similar are very close together in terms of period and, and wave height. And I should say that the wave heights and the wave periods that are marked on here are at model scale, not at full scale. Those are close together, but, but although that's the same amount of, of energy effectively in a state, the directionality and the mix of, of, of waves in those states is very different. So the spectral shapes are different and the directionality is different. And uh, then we have some things that we can't do. so. The little red triangle is, is, contains waves of too short a period for the tank to be able to create. And the red diamonds indicate some, uh, some sea states where we would overtop the wave makers and we're not allowed to do that. So those are conditions which we, we couldn't uh, reproduce. Uh, if we look in detail at, at so we'll look in detail at the, uh, the four C states outlined in red, just to show what I mean. You can see here the, the uh, spectral shapes and indeed the uh, directional spectra for each of, those, each of those conditions. And you can see that they are very, very different conditions, although they all fall in the same frequency bin. And so rather than just thinking about cross waves or thinking about uh, waves in the same direction as the model, we tend to think about mixed sea states where we might have swell waves from one direction, local wind driven sea from another direction, and we can get a much more realistic set of conditions in the tank. Um, and this is an example of the co correction process. So we know what was measured at, at EMEC, that's the desired sea states. We know what we measured in the tank and we can, and we can correct for that. 
and then we have corrections depend on wave the wave, reflection coefficients depend on the wave numbers and you can see that at higher uh, at higher uh, frequencies then we get more reflection in the tank and in the videos that you saw of the w2 power flat, uh, tests there was uh, a floating barrier in the tank which was absorbing those high frequency waves uh, to to correct for that so this is an example of one of those mixed seas that being created in the tank it's a still image um, but uh, but you can see just how complicated that sea, sea uh, conditions look and if you didn't see all the structure around the tank of, uh, that gives you an idea of the scale of those waves and you showed this picture to, to a mariner then they would say that it's a very realistic looking sea condition and we have some breaking waves we have we have uh, uh, quite a mixture of sea conditions. So the last thing I want to talk about for the last few minutes is some, some tidal turbine tests. We have a set of three uh, model tidal turbines which were constructed for originally for a Supergen project and have been extended in a couple of other projects um, to, to build them. These are not scale models of tidal turbines. They are really dynamometers that simulate the power uh, uh, train of a, of a tidal turbine. So we can put real blades on them and we can put them in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the tank and we can, we can do things with them. They have a lot of sensors on them. So they have root bending moment transducers. They measure torque and thrust on the rotor and speed and various other things. And we typically mount them on a, um, on a load cell. So just to show you some tests underway, uh, this, is, uh, this is the turbines being loaded into the water. One of the features of the tank is that we lift the floor up, we do all the installation, and then once, the, once everything's installed, we lower the floor and we're ready to test. Um, and also, because we don't, uh, we don't have a wave direction, if you want to test your model with waves coming from a different direction, the waves move and the model doesn't. So this is some underwater video of those tests being performed. And you can see this is combined waves and current. And if we'd had more time to talk, I would have spent some time talking about how we have to adjust the spectra that we're using for the waves to account for the fact that we have waves in current. But that's all I wanted to say. And I hope you've enjoyed this brief talk about FlowWave. And I'm sorry that we couldn't, um, that we couldn't uh, bring you for a, a tour of the facility. Um, I'll finish with... Uh, uh, a video of uh, one of the tank's other party pieces, um, though there is a much better video of this on YouTube uh, that was filmed by the slow-mo guys. Okay. So thank you very much. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.